SciTech is headquartered in Brno, Czech Republic, the birthplace of Gregor Mendel and a global hub for electron microscopy. Situated in the heart of Europe with an excellent quality of living, Brno is more affordable than other EU cities, allowing for a comfortable way of life in a city that ranks among the best and safest in the world. Moreover, Brno is known as the European Silicon Valley. There are universities and a competitive business environment with hundreds of R&D companies, thousands of people employed in science, and millions of euros spent on research each year. That's why more than 1,400 employees from roughly 45 countries do science at SciTech. Here, they have the power to make our world a safer, more efficient, and more sustainable place to live. The arrival of Industry 4.0 means production is becoming increasingly automated and digitalized. Although companies often have their own proprietary solutions, they're typically not standardized, so manufacturing continues to take place in independent and unconnected units of various size. Two Czech and two German research institutes have joined forces in the creation of a project for new intelligent, secure, and sophisticated solutions for distributed manufacturing in the Industry 4.0 environment. The collective effort led to the establishment of RECAPE, the Research and Innovation Center on Advanced Industrial Production. RECAPE primarily focuses on developing an entirely new concept of multi-site production in which each machine has a digital twin that reflects its characteristics and communicates with other digital twins. Digital twins aren't used only for individual machines. Entire manufacturing units and other entities involved in production can have them too. This makes it possible to simulate the entire production process and reciprocal communication, thus significantly accelerating production preparation while eliminating the occurrence of errors. Thanks to artificial intelligence, manufacturing units are able to share knowledge with one another and the system can optimize production and respond quickly to constantly changing environments. Moreover, the combination of virtual reality and augmented reality allows additional virtual devices to be introduced to the production process and tested prior to their physical implementation in shop floor. Likewise, potential new suppliers can enter the process as well as the customer who can configure the parameters of the required product and make other changes if necessary, even at the last minute. These are the principles upon which future automated multi-site production networks will be built and upon which they will accelerate the implementation of new manufacturing processes, reduce production costs, and make it easier for companies to enter the market and value chains. Production as a service and shared resources. This is the future of industrial manufacturing. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second Rike Project Seminar of 2022. It is the first seminar this year with the audience that made it here in person. So this is a warm welcome to all of you here in this room and also to you who are sitting at your computers, smartphones or tablets and that are watching us online. How to make the least environmental impact with our products, services and processes. This is a key question for current world that deals with the environmental crisis caused by unsustainability. Life cycle assessment, circular economy and eco-design are the three topics of three speakers that came here in person to present to you their knowledge. It is my great pleasure to welcome here Franco Zanini that came from Italy from Elettra Synchrotrone Trieste and Miroslav Londin of JIC, and also Eliška Knotkova, who is representing uh, Eco Design Studio, that will join us a little bit later. We are meeting here on the ground of CETEC Beauty, an institution that is part of RECAPE project. RECAPE project is a project that aims to develop new, intelligent, and secure solutions for distributed manufacturing in the Industry 4.0 environment. One of the parts of the project is also to highlight some 
hot topics of nowadays science, technology and society. This is why the series of Rike projects was uh, Rike project seminars like this one was introduced last year and why we are heating, uh, meeting today to discuss sustainability. The speakers are ready not only to present to you what they know and what they learned, but also to discuss with you. So if you have a question, there will be some time to ask and to answer. So please just let me know after each of the presentation, there will be some time for Q&A and just raise your hand and I will pass you a microphone that is ready so everyone can hear you, not only people here in this room, but also those who are watching us online. If you would like to ask something and you are not here, but you are online, you can add your question in the bar that is under the live stream that you are watching right now. I will ask for you. So I hope that you will enjoy all the presentations and I think that the first one is about to start. Life cycle assessment is a methodology for assessing potential environmental impacts associated with all the stages of the life cycle of commercial product or process or service. It helps to quantify the environmental pressures related to goods and, uh, goods and services, the environmental benefits and the trade-offs, and it helps to find areas uh, for improving, taking into account the whole life cycle of the product. So what if we took this methodology and looked at so-called green plants, green energy plants? This is a topic for Franco Zanini. He is a senior scientist and leader of the Cultural Heritage Project at Electra Synchrotrone Trieste, which is a multidisciplinary international research center of excellence specialized in generating high quality synchrotron and free electron laser light and applying it into materials and life sciences. And now more from Franco Zanini in person. It works. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay. First of all, thanks for this kind invitation. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me. We have a long history of friendship and collaboration between our institutions. Uh, Professor Kaiser, how, how long have we been collaborating? 20 years? I to say. <laughs> yeah, we were six years old when we, when we, when we started 20 years ago. Um, Okay, sustainability. Sustainability is one of the mottos of this decade. Uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, everything had to be nano. Uh, nanotechnology, nanomaterials, and, and everybody tries to make nano, even things with nano were not. The same things happen with the sustainability. Uh, everybody pushes and tries to, to sell as sustainable processes things, objects, which are not sustainable. Uh, you've heard the, the, the word greenwashing, which is uh, unfortunately a common trend. One example is electric cars. Maybe they're sustainable from a local point of view, because uh, when you're in the traffic, an electric car is more sustainable than a classical car. But if you look at the whole life cycle of uh, an electric car, since you have to charge the batteries with conventional systems, so burning coal, burning oil, producing electricity, and when you have to dismiss the car, and especially the batteries, then you see that at the end, in the whole life cycle, an electric car now is, is not a sustainable object. Um, but it's, it's an old motto coming from management. Uh, only things that can be measured can be managed. So it's very important to us to have a measure of sustainability, not only to, sell, to say if something is sustainable or not, but especially if we want to compare to processes or to objects to make choices. Uh, if you want to understand why a whole process is, looks sustainable, but it's not. So there is some hot point. We want to look for that. Uh, so you can make a process more sustainable, trying to eliminate that hot spot and try to convert it in, in some ways. And to do that, we have to measure, to have numbers. Life cycle assessment is a technique which is not new, but uh, it, it was reserved to specialists. And 
I don't think everybody should be able to calculate life cycle assessment. So the, the impact uh, of, of a process on the, not only on the environment, but on the health of, or on a specific part of the environment. I want to know if that process is, is, calling, is causing eutrophy to the, to, the, to the oceans or is causing uh, bladder cancer or, or whatever. But I think scientists and technologists should be able, in any way, to understand the output of a life cycle assessment work in order to understand and to be, to be the first one to, to act on a, on a process. Because processes are not sustainable or not sustainable. They have a certain degree of sustainability. So we need, this is a method which evaluate technologies, systems, objects, processes. And that's necessary if you want to give to our sons, to our nephews, a better world, a world that can be useful for them. Uh, I will give an example, which is a classic example. I, every, uh, all my colleagues, all professors of, uh, uh, which teach life cycle assessment, uh, use this example. Uh, you know that uh, British people, uh, they cannot lie, they cannot live without uh, lamb. Uh, they eat a lot of, of lamb, but they don't produce enough. So they, they import uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of tons of lamb every year, mostly from New Zealand, 70%, and then a big percentage from Australia, and a small percentage, 10% from the EU. So 10 years ago, environmental people said, ah, that's not fine. I mean, it's, it's, it's so heavy. The impact of uh, more than 20,000 kilometers of transportation of lamb from New Zealand to England. So you should eat more uh, British lamb, which is more sustainable. Uh, if you say so, say, well, that sounds reasonable. I mean, to transport a kilogram of meat from New Zealand, from Australia to the United Kingdom is, is not sustainable. But y y you cannot think like that. We have to, to think in terms of the whole life cycle of the process. Um, my colleagues from New Zealand uh, 10 years ago produced a nice article uh, where they analyzed all the life cycle from, from cradle, from uh, the birth of the, of the lamb in New Zealand, down to the moment in which the, the people in England not only eat uh, the lamb and, or cooks the lamb, but they, they throw away the bones uh, and, uh, and the package. And every single aspect of this life cycle has been considered. Uh, is this the laser? Yeah. So you have to think what you're taking from the environment, you're taking from the, from the world. Uh, in every single step, uh, for example, at the, in, while you're breeding and, and, and farming, uh, you have to use fertilizers for the, for the grass, you have to use uh, lime for, for the grass, uh, fuel and, and electricity, of course. Uh, you produce meat, which is sent to a meat processing plant, but you also produce wool, other kinds of meat, which are good. So you're, you're producing something, and this is, has a negative effect on, the, on the unsustainability. And you do this for every single step, from the meat processing plant in, uh, in New Zealand, to the shipping in refrigerated containers, which consume energy, uh, at retail distribution center in the UK, and then transportation to the supermarket where the, this meat needs to be refrigerated. Uh, you have packaging waste, uh, you have meat waste, uh, down to the, to, the, to the lady which is going to the supermarket, buys the meat, goes home, cooks the meat for the family, and then they throw away what is left. Uh, so you have something you take from the, the atmosphere, something you put in the atmosphere, something you recycle, something which is good, something which is bad. 
if you make a life cycle assessment calculation on this, pro on this process, uh, well, you have a surprise. Uh, let's, let's think about uh, carbon footprint. The carbon footprint of a kilogram of, uh, of lamb is about 19 kilograms of CO2. 80% of that comes from the farm because the animals produce methane, which goes in the atmosphere. Uh, there is animal excreta, which produce nitrates, and the, which go in the atmosphere, must be disposed of. Then you have fuel and electricity and fertilizers and lime. Uh, this is the situation of, of New Zealand. If you look at the same uh, production in, uh, in England, fuel, fuel and electricity goes up immediately. So this number, 80%, increases again. Because, why? Because in New Zealand, animals are free. They, they just go in, uh, in the pasture and they eat the, the grass they find. In UK, it's not the same. They have to be kept in buildings. Uh, you have to nourish the grass. So it's, 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 the situation in UK is, is even worse. Uh, then you have 3% from, from processing, and transportation is, is only 5% of, of, of all the process. So if you think, okay, let's say I cut the transportation because I produce it in UK, uh, I'm, I'm just saving not 5% because you have still some transportation, but saving maybe 4, 3% of the whole footprint of carbon. Uh, if, you, if you work on, uh, on this part, and it's something that has been done during the years, uh, in, in New Zealand, <laughs> during, they're still reducing the impact of, of farming. If you reduce 20% of 80% is much better than reducing 2%, some 1% or 2%. So the, the key problem is not transportation. But if you don't calculate exactly what, what's going on, you, you don't have these numbers, you cannot manage the whole process. So at the end, the meat imported from New Zealand is, is much less impacting on the atmosphere than the same meat which is produced in, uh, directly in UK. Of course, if you, if you look at, at the whole environment, uh, it's, it's one thing, because of course the transportation from uh, the ocean shipping uh, does, does not hit UK, it hits the whole planet. So you can, again, look at this, pro uh, this process locally, regionally, at, in the whole world, but again, what seems to be absolutely uh, unsustainable is the more sustainable choice. Um, life cycle assessment, uh, we will see together some, uh, some examples of how it works and what is produced. Uh, again, I, we, nobody pretends that every scientist and every technologist knows how to, to, to play with life cycle assessment, which needs a lot of software, a lot of knowledge, uh, big databases. It's, it's an expensive technique. The best thing to do is to ask a company who makes this work to, to make the calculations, but you have to read them, you have to understand them, you have to, to, to use them in order to improve your process. Um, so life cycle assessment is, is a loop you have to define your goals, so what you want to measure, the impact on the human health, on the environment, on which part of the environment. Uh, you have to make a, an inventory analysis, so to define in the, per, in the perfect way whole the, pro, the whole process and understanding every single detail of the process, what that part of the process needs from the, from the world and, and puts in the, in, the, in the atmosphere. Interpret the data and use loop until you have a final solution. The applications are, are manifold. 
from development and improvement of products and processes to strategic planning. Uh, I want to see uh, which is the best we will see in the second part of the talk, which is the best product. I want to, to make uh, a, a wind energy park in, in some part of Canada. Uh, which is the best machine I want to buy. Uh, so it's, it's a local effect, uh, because if, if most of the components of these things come from uh, Europe, uh, the, the impact is higher than to buy from a company which is settled in the United States, for example. Public policy making, politicians need to make general decisions. We want to invest in wind, we want to invest uh, in uh, um, other forms of, uh, of uh, energy. Marketing. I want to show that my product, that my process is sustainable. I don't want to make greenwashing because people is not believing anymore. So you start from what we call in, uh, in, uh, in life cycle uh, elementary flows. So I need I need gas, I need uh, polyethylene, I need energy, I need uh, everything. And I put them in what I call midpoints. So the, the important points for sustainability. It can be climate change, uh, human toxicity, uh, acidification, uh, land use, because if, if I if I use, uh, again, a lot of land to make solar panels and I don't produce any more food in that land, that, again, has an impact uh, on, on society. Let's remember that sustainability has three branches, generally. The social impact, uh, an environmental impact, and an economic impact. Uh, so you have to take care of three, these three topics at the same time. Somebody are more interested in one of them, but you should consider uh, all of them. So what we call endpoint uh, in, in this case uh, are mainly human health, natural environment, natural resources. So results from uh, LCA are not only general results. Uh, I can ask the company, okay, please make a calculation of LCA for this process, but I'm more interested on the impact uh, on the society of this project. Uh, will I need to, to fire people, for example, so the occupation will be involved uh, in, my, in my process? Or is this going to cause an increase in cancer in a particular area of my region of the world? So these are all considerations that I, that I need to make. Uh, this is a classic uh, model. Uh, I will describe a very, very simple model the life cycle assessment of the production of, uh, of a grocery bag, the bags you, you buy at the supermarket. For example, because you want to know if it's real that paper bags are more environmental friendly than plastic bags. And it's not true. Just think at one thing. Transportation, again. You have a big box containing bags. In that box, you can put 1,000 plastic bags or 100 paper bags. So the, the problem of transplantation of paper bags is much higher than that of plastic bags, which can be recycled more easily than paper bags. And so again, it, it's not true that the, they have the same impact. You, you have to make calculations. And you can be extremely detailed, for example, in, in, I, I made this simulation, which is a classic one, and that I'm going to show you. Uh, you can even take into consideration the ink that you use to, to, to print this on the paper. That ink must be produced. And to produce ink, you need uh, trucks to transport the material from one side to the other. You need to produce it. You need to transport it to the back factory. So it has an impact. In, in that case, uh, the impact uh, have had so small numbers that we, we could delete it and forget the process. But in principle, you can take into consideration even that, which is a small number, but it produces something. 
then you decide that everything below one part per million is negligible, you, you cancel because calculations are simpler, you, you, you need less paper, and so on. Here you have, uh, we divided the processes in foreground processes, which are the processes which are directly needed for the production of the bag, uh, exclude the process, the ink, and background process. Uh, polyethylene bags are made out of ethylene. And to make ethylene, you need petrol and you need gas. And again, you need to extract gas and to extract petrol, you need to transport and everything. So these are part of the process. They're not directly involved, but they're needed. And very often, they, they're very heavy. Uh, so as the manufacturing of the boxes that you need to transport, you have to calculate that. You see, that in this case, it's, it's very important. Uh, recycling, different choices in recycling can make a process sustainable or unsustainable, because for with some some of these materials, you can make uh, uh, tiles for for houses, for example, and so your process be becomes a little bit more sustainable. Uh, let me go to the computer. I have uh, an Excel file I'm going to show you. Sorry. Yes, you can go out of this. Just just reduce it and go to the directory. Should be an Excel file. How uh, sustainable is it? This one. Plastic bag? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Forgot my glasses. privilege of age. Okay. Okay, may sit here? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the, the output of these calculations are usually Excel files. Uh, documentation is very important because you need to know to show what you are calculating, where, where the data come from, uh, because this is what the, your, your client needs. So these are goal and scope definition of the analysis, which is to identify environmental hotspots in the life cycle of uh, a plastic grocery bag, so determine life cycle stages and everything. You produce a system diagram, like the one I showed before. So you have to calculate all the resources inputs for nature and all the emissions to air, to water, and land of your, of your process. This is a very delicate point, scaling. Uh, your reference is uh, a, a single bag, or you can say 1,000 bags, whatever you like. And so you see that you have to calculate the distance of the transport of materials from one place to the other. And you see that uh, you have databases for production of any element, any material in the world. There are databases for life cycle assessment. So you know how much gas you need to extract to produce a single bag, since you're scaling. Uh, you see here output requirements and for every single uh, unit process. You see here inputs from nature, what we are considering, so coal, oil, hydropower, natural gas, solar. Of course, if you're using solar energy to produce something, is much more sustainable than using coal. 
And these are all the outputs to nature. Oops, sorry. Uh, this something wrong. All the substances we know that make some damage to the environment or to the, or to the health. So for every single step of the process, we calculate the production of these substances and, and where they go. If they go in the atmosphere, in the, if they go in the sea, uh, wherever they go. And you see the number of substances is, uh, is heavy. Uh, data quality requirements. Uh, this study is the production of, of uh, this material in the United States. Uh, different places could have different costs of materials, different ways to produce. Uh, temporal coverage, uh, we have data which, which should not be older than 10 years ago. Some data are fresh, some are, uh, some are less. Uh, data quality assessment, where we found this data, how old are they? Okay. And we can put here, because we would like everybody who, needs, who reads these uh, papers to, to make their own calculations, to change them if they have different solutions, if they live in a different place. And uh, so they, they work in, in, in different ways. And here starts the real calculation. You remember we divided foreground processes, background processes, and uh, useless processes. Ethylene. Uh, we have data, in this case, which were rather old. And these are some new data. And here we see how much Um, for the production of the ethylene required for the bag, we have, sorry, but I'm a Mac user, and sometimes, uh, no, not work, sorry. <laughs> uh, so you see that we have some categories, some uh, materials, uh, which are producers, some are not, but we consider all of them. So we have a lot of zeros, but we see here that carbon dioxide is produced, uh, carbon tetrachloride, we don't have chlorine, but we have hydrocarbons. So we have all this, one table for each step and each material in the single processes. Gives you uh, the production of uh, HDP resin, which is the final material of our example. We have transport. And the, in, in this case, uh, we, we are using uh, diesel powered trucks, uh, but we could change that. So, for example, if in my country I prefer to use trains, uh, I, can, I can change it. I can change it here, you know, and I look at the final numbers to understand if you're using train and using trucks. You will see this in the, in the, in the example in the second part of the talk, uh, which is the best solution for transportation. Uh, could be that transportation by boat is uh, more or less sustainable. So you see, you, very often you have a lot of surprises for that. Uh, then we have the production of, uh, of the grocery bags. Uh, the packaging in the cardboard boxes is another activity which, in principle, can produce uh, uh, needs energy anyway, and produces a lot of a lot of materials. Let's go waste collection, transportation. You have to choose the place where you're going to dispose uh, all your materials. And same things for the, I don't know why it's showing this. 
same things for the background processes. The processes which are not directly involved in the production of the bags, but they are needed because if I want to produce ethylene, I need to produce petrol before I need to extract, to transport. So you see that uh, we are considering really every single detail of, uh, uh, of this production. Let's go to the, to the end. See here, we have all the data of, uh, of the landfill. Uh, you have a lot of production of, uh, of, of garbage at, at the end. Sorry, but there is this thing coming out. OK, these are the, the LCI life cycle inventory summary results. So you have uh, the sum of, of these results. You can uh, conglomerate these results in different ways if you want to, to, to have different information about different parts uh, of, the, of the process. You have, the, for example, primary energy input results was the impact from the point of view of energy of the production of a, of a plastic bag. Uh, here you have the, the interaction with different parts of sustainability. So uh, how much this process impacts on global warming, on acidification, eutrophication, ecotoxicity, human health, uh, both cancer and non-cancer uh, diseases. Uh, so you, you, you can manage these results uh, in, the way, in the way you want. Because, for example, if, you, if these data are important for your Ministry for Health, uh, they're more interested in the second part of the results. If you're interested in, uh, in your Ministry for uh, for industry that interested in the first part. Uh, so th there are a lot of different interpretation of this data. And we see it in the final example where you have to compare two models of wind turbine. And as a function of what you need, uh, you, have, you can choose model one or model two because they have, they have different impacts. They're not one is impact more than the other. Um, these are the, f the, f the final results, uh, contribution of uh, uni-processes to the triassic categories, which are the, what we call midpoints again. You see that, for example, recycling, you look on, on the bottom of these numbers, uh, recycling has a, a negative impact, has a positive, positive in terms of, of good quality impact on the system. The more you recycle, the more the environment is, uh, is happy. This why it has a minus sign. Uh, so you have, a, a, this data can be, can be seen in, uh, in a lot of different ways in order to extract the values uh, you need more. These are all the references where you, we took all the data for production, transportation, and so on for, uh, for different materials. Uh, so as you see, this is, this is a, a crude result. The interpretation of these results uh, is left uh, to the scientists, to the technologists, to the um, structure who wanted these calculations. And this calculation must be interpreted and must be read in the correct way. That's why I think that 
uh, everybody interested in the impact of the research uh, should, should be able to read this, this data. This is becoming more and more important. Uh, within a couple of weeks, uh, the IAEA, the International Agency for Atomic Energy, is organizing a workshop in, uh, in Vienna about the, um, the, the impact of uh, particle accelerators and results of particle accelerators, because they're pushing towards the better knowledge of these techniques by scientists in order not only to build a, a synchrotron or a neutron source or, or whatever, but to calculate the way in, in which the, the results are analyzed. So not in terms only of economic or scientific results, but in terms of the impact of these results on the, on the planet. Okay. Uh, let me go back to the presentation. This, ah, this one, yes. This the first one. Okay. So. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, it was a tedious part, but it, it was important because it's, it, it's, it's the only way to show what kind of results, what, we, what you can obtain from a, a life cycle calculation. Uh, to conclude this part of, uh, of the talk, uh, um, every time engineers, scientists, uh, uh, managers of science uh, need to decide about the sustainability. Every time sustainability is a concern of your research, you need tools to understand and to make decisions and to look for the best solutions in terms of a life cycle perspective. So not only on single aspects of your research, of your process, of your product, but you need to take into consideration a life cycle perspective. Uh, very often, because you, you want to trade between different impacts on the three different families of sustainability, as I said, social, um, uh, economic, and environmental. Just to give you an example, uh, let's try to imagine if they uh, in, immediately uh, stop building uh, traditional cars uh, and they make only perfect electric cars the, which do not impact on the environment and, the, and so we, everybody's happy the hundreds of thousands of people who's going to be fired from the companies who make traditional engines will not be happy uh, so you need to look for trade-offs uh, between the social impact uh, of what you're doing and the environmental impact uh, because, again, you need a conversion of, of the industries of traditional motors before you, you start doing, taking decisions which only have an environmental impact. Or maybe these cars are costing, well, I say, $1 million each because they only produce very nice and speedy cars. Very few people can buy them. So a lot of people is not using transportation anymore. So um, life cycle assessment can take care even of social problems, of the impact on occupation, on the possibility of people with a mid salary or low salary to approach the solutions. So uh, it, it's a very delicate and trade-offs between different impacts of solutions are, are very important. Uh, so designers and engineers who I just read, who design and develop products and technical systems should be able to critically read and evaluate life cycle assessment information about the alternatives that they are considering. So that we don't pretend them to be able to perform these calculations, but they should be able to read and interpret these calculations. And the environmental sustainability specialists among them should also be able to perform the LCA studies. So if in your group there is somebody who is interested only in the environmental uh, part of, of the application, they should be able to perform these calculations, in my, my personal opinion. 
OK. What time is it now? 9.45. Nine? Mm, great. <laughs> OK. Uh, I just put a, something just for uh, relaxing. Uh, a small movie about, uh, since we are here in the Czech Republic, which is famous for, uh, sorry, for beautiful women. <laughs> and uh, no, I, my, my neck is, is bad when I just arrived here. And uh, in beer, uh, I show a small movie about sustainability of beer, which is unfortunately still a non sustainable product. <laughs> Please. From a brewing perspective, I think one of the most important aspects is actually beer consistency. How do you produce the same beer time and time again and kind of maintain that consistency and taste? Um, and then we bring in the sustainability aspect into this, and particularly with climate variability, or these changing patterns of rainfall, drought, uh, even fires in certain areas and so on. So this creates real challenges, I think, for producing consistent beer ingredients. Hops are one of the most important ingredients for the brewing process. Um, they, they give it its flavor, they give it its character, um, and brewers are, especially craft brewers, are very particular about the kind of hops they have and the chemical qualities of those hops. And so they get them from wherever they can. Uh, a majority of the hops grown at this brewery come from Germany and the United States. From a sustainability perspective, I would say that the beer industry has been lagging a little bit behind the wine industry, but it is becoming something that's quite talked about. And I think one thing in Sweden here that's quite interesting recently is the discussion about local production. Can we produce local beer ingredients here within Skåne, within Sweden, and use those for the actual the beer that's actually produced? What we're trying to do here in terms of sustainability is test different types of indoor growing systems for hops. And I think the interesting sustainability aspect here is actually growing them on site here at the brewery. So we have one system here that's just normal growing uh, hops in boxes in soil like you would see outside, um, but we have a controlled environment here. The other one, maybe the other more interesting one here is actually growing them hydroponically. So they're growing them without soil, with a water system here that there's, they're watered once an hour with a nutrient rich water. And you can see by one of them here that we're getting fantastic growth of the actual plant. The other aspect that's actually interesting over this is that we're using waste heat, waste cooling and excess carbon dioxide from the brewery so we can actually heat or cool the greenhouse here year round. I think within this project, one of the most important parts then is to focus on the local or what we call the hyper-local production here of the hops. If we can build systems that hops are actually produced on site or very regionally, that that's the best way to pr promote sustainability. Uh, the goal of this living lab then is to test on a very small scale if it's possible to both grow hops hydroponically inside and then grow them uh, year round. So this is one thing that we'll start out by testing this. And then we can do future studies, I think, to then look at more, is there a way to upscale all of this and have something done on more of a commercial scale. Okay, yes, now people is getting more and more involved in sustainability of beer. Beer is, is really a non-sustainable product in principle. Uh, you need a, something between three to seven barrels of water to produce one barrel of, of, of beer. You need a lot of energy to heat uh, beer during the first part of the production. 
you need a lot of energy to cool beer during the second part of the production. Um, the water which results from the production is undrinkable. Um, you have a lot of production of byproducts uh, which are mostly useless. And, and so people is now, is now working on that. Uh, I've seen once a microbrewery in the United States, uh, uh, they were very much involved in, in sustainability. So what they did, for example, they, they used the water for the byproduct of water to cool the system. So the water was used to some extent. All the byproducts uh, were sent to a, f a pig farm, which was nearby. And since they had this microbrewery had a small restaurant, they bought pigs from the producer, uh, and this and this they they cooked the pork for the for the clients. So they try to make a but this is something local. Uh, but there is a tendency now to work on this process, and I think that for, uh, your country should do should should do more now. Nobody's doing anything important. Just at the local, local targets. Uh, you see local small universities like uh, Lund in Sweden and, and so on. So this is some, another fine field of research. It should be used more and more. We can go to the second part of the, of the talk, please. Uh, as I said, LC LCA can be applied to almost every kind of production. We selected this field, we decided together with the, with the staff of, uh, of SATEC, which is energy systems, uh, green energy systems, like um, wind parks, uh, uh, solar systems. They're considered to be green by definition. Well, it's not true. No process is green. Uh, every, every process has its, its drawbacks. We, we just need to calculate them and, and to try to make the most of this calculation using, for example, LCAs. Um, in the field of energy plants, we generally have two approaches in, um, in, in terms of uh, sustainability calculations. The first one is when you study a specific energy system or technology or, uh, or just a plant. Uh, I need to know, okay, how sustainable is uh, production of energy using uh, oil? Or how much is that plant producing energy with oil? Uh, what's the difference between these, these two plants? Which part of the plant is the one which is more less sustainable. What can I do to perform better in in that part of the of the project? Uh, the goals of this kind of studies usually include weak point analysis uh, uh, for eco design, report on environmental performances of new technologies or new plants. Uh, another approach is in a contact perspective. It usually is a uh, meso scale or la large scale, so you want to look at uh, uh, what happens in a region, uh, say Central Europe, uh, or a nation, or a, a region of a nation. Um, so these studies are usually associated with goals oriented to policy. Uh, the government should define, okay, what's going to be the energy policy of our country for the next 10 years? Uh, how much is the impact uh, of uh, local production on a regional production? Because we know, I remember years ago, we made some calculations on uh, uh, the heavy, heavy metals contained in the coal particles coming from uh, um, power plants uh, using carbon. And it was a mess because uh, we, we found out that um, powder from coal plants uh, turned twice around the world before falling down. So uh, what, what you're producing here in, uh, in the Czech Republic is affecting the health in New Zealand and vice versa. So uh, there are different contexts you want to examine. And this approach 
is, is related to, to, to policy uh, approaches. One of the strengths of uh, LCA in this field is the adoption, of course, of a life cycle perspective. So you include all the life cycle stages from the extraction of raw materials for the construction of your plant uh, to the final disposal stage, including, of course, uh, uh, management of the, uh, and, and working of, uh, of your plant. Uh, this is important because uh, very often life cycle is truncated, so some elements are not taken into consideration, and very often these are the hotspots of your, of your system. Um, LCA studies demonstrated, but well, it was logic, that you have two different patterns. Uh, let's say you, you have two classes, of course, uh, of, uh, of power plants. One, which is uh, uh, system based on, uh, on fossils, uh, on biomasses, uh, on nuclear power. So every time you have real fuel consumption, you're burning something to produce energy. And the other class of plants are the plants where you're not burning anything. Uh, wind power, solar power, hydropower, geothermal power. But these plants, they're not completely green because you have to build them. You have to transport uh, uh, your parts of the plants uh, from the production place to the place where they're going to work. Then you have to, to maintain these things. You have to change things. Uh, and then at the end of the life of the plant, you have to dismiss it. And, they, and all these parts, they have a cost in terms of uh, environmental, uh, environmental weight. This is a very interesting study. Uh, you see here the, the, the article is uh, it's not new, but it has been made very, very, very well, so you can, you can read it. Uh, it's a case study of the uh, environmental analysis of a wine park to be located in the northwest of the United States. Of course, here you don't have uh, burning of materials, so you have uh, a perfectly circular uh, economic system. Uh, you're going from the production of the materials for, for the plant itself, transportation to the site, uh, erection of, the, uh, of, the, of the, the wind systems, operation and maintenance, and then at the end of the life cycle, which is usually about 20 years, you have disposal, which can be just throw them in the landfill, of recycling, and then you go back in the, in the circle again. <clears throat> if you want to study a case like this, for example, you have to consider several points uh, which we will discuss together uh, in the next minutes. Uh, first of all, the characteristics of the wind turbine. In this case, uh, the authors make uh, the comparison between two different models of turbine which were ideal for, for that case. Uh, one is the Siemens Gamesa uh, wind turbine. It's made of, it's a four part modular tower. Uh, the energy production is the same, uh, two megawatt. And the Vestas, uh, which comes from, uh, from Finland, uh, it's another wind turbine with a three part tower module. So the difference mainly, uh, we see there are other differences. The difference is, is mainly in the, in the construction uh, of the tower. Then the components of the turbine and the materials involved in, the, in their production. The authors looked at every single part, the important part, which are the, the rotor assembly, uh, the tower, the nacelle, which is the long part on top, and the foundation. For the two different options, they looked at materials needed for every single part of the construction and how much material was needed. You see here a big difference. There is a lot more steel in model one with respect with, uh, with number two. There is a lot of difference in the lubricant used in the two, in the two models. Uh, others are the same, almost the same. For example, steel for the, for the foundation, the concrete for the foundation, and so on. These numbers are important because of course, the production 
and the transportation of these materials are fundamental for the calculation of the life cycle assessment of these two, these two mm, solutions. Then operation and, and management. Uh, in, in both cases, uh, the plan for the operation of this turbine was a regular inspection, yeah, a diesel truck with some technicians coming to the site three times a week, three times a year to make a check, changes of oil and different lubricants, and the mobile, mobile parts were replaced only once during a 20 years lifetime existence of the, of the system. Transportation, uh, the authors uh, calculated the distance from the site of the suppliers of the different components, and that's make a difference. For example, look at uh, the Yopich system of the of the of the um, of the nacelle. Uh, Gamesa bought them in Spain, uh, which is uh, eight thousand kilometers away, while Vesas bought them in uh, in Kentucky, which is three thousand kilometers away. And there are a lot of values which are which are different, and this implies a difference at the end in the environmental cost of the production of this of this system. Then dismantling and recycling. Uh, these are data which are well known. Uh, concrete, you, you cannot do anything else uh, except for throwing them in a landfill. And in this case, they calculate a location 50 kilometers for the wheel park uh, to have uh, an idea of the, of the numbers. Uh, so fiberglass must be thrown away. Uh, some materials can be incinerated. Uh, oil, plastics, rubber. Some can be recycled. Copper can be recycled very well. Iron can be recycled. Steel can be recycled. Steel is very heavy from the point of view of production, but it's, it's very good from the point of view of recycling, for example. So, it, uh, you know, it, uh, the, the sheet is, is short, so you, you, th you push it in a way, you put it in the other, and uh, it still have problems. Uh, these are the results of the LCA studies. They made two studies. One, uh, the life cycle impact assessment method, which I described before, using this software, RACP, which is a very good software. Uh, they ha this system has mm, 18 midpoints categories. Remember, midpoints were the list of, uh, of points where you have effect of the of the of the, the process and another interesting number which is often used is the energy payback this is used to measure how long a system must operate to generate sufficient energy to offset the amount of energy required during its entire life let's say uh, i need uh, 10 to mm, megawatts to uh, to build the system uh, the system produces mm, 100, which means that it lasts 10 years. This means that after one year, I recover the energy I spent for the construction of the whole system. Sometimes you're interested in the, in the difference in, in, in the energy payback of a system and not in an environmental system. Or maybe if the environmental uh, footprint is the same, you look at the solution, which is more interesting from the, in terms of energy payback. Uh, these are the results. Again, I introduced another thing I didn't introduce before. You, you can have different approaches in the interpretation of the results. These are usually called individualist, hierarchies, or egalitarian. It depends on the consideration you have in terms of social activity, of impact on nature. Uh, in this case, uh, we will describe only the hierarchies, uh, um, which offer the most balanced view of damage types. Uh, hierarchies place more importance uh, on uh, resource and ecosystem quality, while uh, individualists uh, give less importance of, on, uh, on human health. Uh, you see that in all cases, this is the impact of model one uh, in white, the impact of model two in black, 
in, in all the three perspectives, the impact of the first model, the, the Siemens model, is much higher than the impact of the second model. We can analyze this data in, in, in a lot of different ways. For example, uh, you can see here for the first model and the second model, the distribution of environmental impact in the different parts of its life. You see here the manufacturing is much, oh, sorry, Manufacturing is the key part. Uh, maintenance and operation is negligible. So they, they, they don't do anything on the, on the environment. So the production is, is, the, is the key point. Dismantling and recycling, of course, they have a negative, which means positive, impact on the environment because you're recovering resources which can be used again without being produced. You can see the distribution of the impact disaster today uh, in the different elements uh, you see we see here that in both cases the tower is the responsible for most of the environmental impact uh, on uh, on the system unfortunately the author use different scales uh, you see in the in the graphic that doesn't help but uh, this means that the solution with three modules or four modules is really making a difference. Using more steel or less steel is uh, maybe the, 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 the most important cause of uh, uh, the, the bad environmental quality of the first solution with respect to the second one. Um, here you see again the environmental impact of major material inputs for, for, for both models. Uh, so you see here, there is a lot more steel on model one. Uh, there is more cast iron in also in model one, while all the other materials are pretty much, pretty much the, same, the same effect. Model one requires 35 tons more steel than model two. Um, uh, so it, you see that... Uh, Model one outperforms uh, uh, most of the times model, model two. Uh, we can use those data to try to change some parameters and to look at the effect of these changes. For example, if this is the description we had before for both models, uh, scenario one is a scenario where you have an increase in maintenance over the wind uh, lifespan, and uh, you see the, ef the effect is, is, is negligible, and, and still you have model two performing better. Uh, scenario two, you have an increase in the percentage of material recycling to 100%. So you try to rec recover more material than the other case, and again, the effect is negligible. Scenario three, as I said before, we try to change transportation type. Instead of transporting everything by road, I transport it by train to see if I have an effect, a significant effect. And we see here that, yes, we have a, a, a small effect that doesn't change our decision on the, on the model, but uh, model two is almost the same. Model one, there is a difference. This is due to the materials which are used, which are more heavy on the on the side of uh, transportation. Uh, as I said before, the energy payback time is an important indicator for renewable resources. Um, a, a wind turbine like this one generates uh, approximately 6.12 gigawatt hour per year. Uh, if we assume a 35% capacity factor of the, of the engine. Uh, so, if we analyze this data, we see that the payback time of model one is 0.43 years. So, after 0.43 years, which is approximately five months, uh, the energy given by the system equals the energy used to build the system. For model two, is 0.53 years. So, it's a little bit higher. It's, one month of difference. So if you're considering 
life cycle energy use. And model one is a little bit better than model two. So it depends on, on, on what you want. In this case, the difference is negligible. The environmental impact of model one is much higher than model two. So the choice went to model one, of course. Uh, in conclusion of this part, uh, the main life cycle environmental impacts of a wind turbine originate from the manufacturing stage. So not on the transportation uh, on, the, on, the, on the field, on the maintenance uh, and uh, on the operation. Uh, the user stage has an almost negligible environmental impact due to maintenance activities which compared to the, all the other numbers are practically zero. The transportation distances of wind turbine components to the wind park heavily influence environmental impacts, as we see, because there are differences of thousands of kilometers of transportation, and transportation is, has an environmental impact. Model 2 is superior in terms of broad environmental performance, you see, in all parts of the system while Model 1 would be selected as the better option if we consider only the life cycle energy use. So how much energy gives back uh, uh, as compared to the energy uh, that they use to build the system. Uh, so in, in this case, in case of a power, or wind power plant, but the same applies to all green power plants, uh, engineering decision makers should consider not only the functional characteristics of wind turbine, so how it works, but also the materials, the component, the different parts of the, of, the, of the system, and the design of the system, and especially the supply chain needed to manufacture, construct, and decommission a wind turbine. At the end, the distances, the, how you move around the world, the part, different parts of the, of the turbine, are really counts uh, on the final uh, on the final design. Okay, I hope this example clarified a little bit more what we described in the first part of uh, uh, of this talk. Uh, if you have uh, if you have questions, uh, feel feel free to feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Pass your microphone. There is a question, so oh. just a minute. Thank you can you. speak right away. Are you aware of any similar calculations done for nuclear reactors? For nuclear reactors. Yes. Uh, which one is better, nuclear or green? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, it, la, The problem of nuclear is still uh, dismissal of, uh, of materials. That uh, has a very high energy impact. Uh, that's why people is working so much on how to get rid of, uh, uh, of the old radioactive materials, the, the, the radioactive waste. Uh, if we, in principle, we, if we can find a, a good solution for that, uh, nuclear plants are, are very good because they, they work forever, they don't have mobile parts. Um, uh, now there are a lot of new solutions. Uh, you know that you can, uh, uh, you can buy a nuclear plant for, let's say, a year if you want to build a, a, a factory in the middle of nowhere. You can build, a, you can, Yes, you can hire for one year a small nuclear plant to have energy to build that. Uh, so there are so many different solutions for, uh, for nuclear plants. I still think that nuclear plants are, are the future of, uh, of, of energy, because of resources, especially. Because in this case, we didn't calculate the fact that oil, gas, and everything, they're not infinite. Uh, so this is another consideration which doesn't fall in life cycle calculations. Uh, that's why your, your question is, is so important, because nuclear, 
of course, from the environmental point of view, is, a, is still a problem, uh, a potential problem very often, because not every uh, nuclear plant is uh, uh, Fukuyama or, or Chernobyl, <laughs> luckily. Uh, if they work, uh, they have the, the greatest possible potential in terms of production of energy. Because all other systems, uh, you, know, that you have to take into account the efficiency. In, uh, there are considerations on the, on the aesthetics, uh, which, uh, which are personal. People say that you're ruining the, the, the panorama with, uh, sometimes it's true. I mean, so for example, if, you're, if your region is very famous for tourism, for panoramas, etc. If you pull wind plants everywhere, uh, you can have, in principle, a loss on uh, on the on the tourism, and that that falls on the social sustainability of the project. So that's why LCA is, has the potential to take into account every every step. In this case, this this plant was in the middle of nowhere, so it was not a problem. But again. Uh, in Italy, a lot of farms, uh, they dedicated a lot of land to solar plants. And in the next years, we will have severe problems of, uh, of food because, because of the war in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I just, just to give you an example, uh, my, one of my sons, my son number three, he directs a, a, a big farm uh, in, uh, in, in the western part of, of Italy where they produce rice. Uh, he's young, so he's always thinking, while most of the other people, they're, they're very conservative. He cut half the production of rice and he put um, sunflowers. Nobody ever planted sunflowers in that region. Everybody was laughing at him. This year it didn't rain, so people did not collect rice. And the price of, of, of sunflowers is equal to, to the price of gold. Uh, so you have to take into account that. My, my son didn't want to produce solar energy in his fields. He wanted to produce food. And this paid. So, Everything is, uh, you have to take into account so many things. Uh, any, any of you would have thought of, of a war in Europe in, in 2022, last year? No. Um, so you're, you still have a lot of uncertainties. And these kind of calculations try to take into account the, the higher possible numbers of uh, uh, of these uh, of these effects. Do you want to react? Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Any other question? Uh, I s like the model LCA is basically uh, working on the materials and uh, the processes, but is there something that is also working on the? societal developments because for example with the meat that you showed with New Zealand so UK it's better to buy the meat in New Zealand okay because of the processes because of the materials but it means that UK can simply say hmm, we will just buy because they have a better farming option and we think that we cannot apply it in our system because it's too complicated so it means that there will be no development in the society in UK and it will be like the improvement in sustainability won't really, won't really work somehow. So mm -hmm. is there something in the model that is also working on this or is it just like put aside? <laughs> no, okay, Th that's politics because of course decision, uh, in, in principle these numbers could help you because of, of course the the climate in, in, uh, in uh, New Zealand is different from the cl climate in, uh, in England. And in, uh, in New Zealand, they never close the, the animals in, in, in closed environments because they're, they're free. In England, you cannot do that. In winter, they have to go in, in buildings. Uh, 
because it's too cold. Uh, every time you, there is a, uh, these numbers can help you in f looking for new solutions, or they can tell you that it's, it's useless to go in that direction because you will never have the climate of, uh, of New Zealand. So maybe you have to think something different. Maybe you have to work uh, in, uh, in a better management of the fields, and this could reduce. But in principle, as, as always, uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear is not bad or good. Nuclear is nuclear. We are bad or good. And the way we, we use numbers is bad or good. Numbers are neither good or bad. Uh, the more information you have, the more rationality you can put in your, in your analysis. Uh, this is another step. Of course, that uh, every time you find a hot spot, uh, the system doesn't tell you, okay, you, you need to change the pressure or change the temperature. It tells you that's bad. It's not working fine. And it's up to, to you to send a technology like this one to find solutions to reduce the impact of, of hot spots uh, of a process uh, on, a, on a system. I personally found that the more information you have, the, the more possibilities you have to improve the quality of, of everything. Do you want to follow up? No? Any other question? No, the only case is when my wife wants to know where I go after, after work. <laughs> In that case, information use can be very bad. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> life cycle assessment cannot be applied yet to, <laughs> to family management. <laughs> I'm going to check the online uh, comments and questions, but I guess they are only spams. <laughs> so maybe we can. <laughs> <laughs> well, people are still too shy to use this, Probably. this system from home. So I would like to encourage once again those who are watching us online to also ask. And there is a question from another speaker. Just, just a short one. Uh, do you know about some database where you can find already uh, finished LCAs for some future reference, you know, something that has been done and we can... Yes, you can, you can, you, you can find a lot of them. Uh, um, if, for example, if you look at, at, at the article on the, on, on, on the wind plants, uh, they, they give a lot of references on LCAs already made. You've seen, in a certain point, I didn't, I didn't tell, there were a, lo a lot of different bars. Uh, some of the bars were calculations made by other groups, uh, not only on that solution, but in other solutions. So in, in principle, you can find uh, these kind of files already made. Uh, of course, it's, it's difficult to apply them to your solution, but they can, they can give you a lot, of, uh, a lot of information. The best thing to do is to apply it yourself. But, now, the, the price of these databases, of course, since it became a business, and the price of software has, uh, has increased. So only big groups and big companies can afford to have their own LCA group uh, inside, inside the company. They prefer to, to, to give it outside. And, uh, so your favorite... Uh, um, can I ask you to follow up the microphone? <laughs> So your favorite one is the recipe software? The recipe is, is, is a very good one. Yeah, OK. Uh, it was, it was you can fun. keep it if you will follow up again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I guess there is still no question from the online audience, but there is from the offline audience. So just wait a second for the microphone. Okay, I'm, I'm more interested in, in economical aspect because I think more decision making is from management of companies and so on. Is it somehow considered if you come up with some, with some new model, you said well, I have model one, model two, what is the economy behind it? Is it taken in consideration? Or are we as a humanity in an age where this will be, get higher priority than the money? No, as, as I said, there is uh, LCA uh, regards materials, what you put in, in the process and what you extract from the process. 
um, economical and social effects uh, of these processes are more manageable than, than this. Because you've seen the list of, uh, of substances which are produced by every single project. Uh, economical studies on, on, on this field, for example, the, I recently read uh, the a study on the economical impact of, uh, and the societal impact, of course, of uh, electric cars. Uh, as I said, in terms uh, of uh, resources, in terms of costs, uh, and especially in terms of occupation, which is one of the, the, the major, major concerns. Um, the balance between these is very often complicated, but if you don't take into account the economical impact uh, and you just consider the, the, the environmental impact, uh, you're, you're out. Uh, if, if you say, okay, I want to go back to uh, an economy and, uh, and, and the life uh, of two centuries ago, I only apply environmental uh, position, but it must be an equilibrium. We produce toxics, uh, you, we consume toxics, and we can try to reduce as much as possible in order to have a planet where to, where to live. Um, it's not easy. For example, the, maybe you've heard a couple of years ago, Xi Jinping said, uh, my dream is to bring a, a glass of milk on the table of every Chinese uh, uh, in the next few years. If you do that, our planet will, will collapse. Because the production of methane from cows is one of the most important causes of uh, CO2. And it, it's, it's terrible. It's just like dropping nuclear bombs uh, everywhere. Uh, so what, what can you say? You say, okay, we have milk. You Chinese, since you are a billion people, you cannot have it. Uh, we have to find an equilibrium solution. We have to find something. You know that the, the problem is that, for example, cows produce methane in their gas emissions. Kangaroos don't. There, is a, there are several groups which are trying with um, genetic techniques uh, to change the, the digestion system of the cows and to make it more similar to the system of the, of the kangaroos. That will solve a lot of problems. Uh, because, I mean, it, 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 you have better solution, best solutions with that than with, with abolition of cars, for example. Uh, it, it's, it's a difficult planet, and, and we are not helping with that. The best solution would be to eliminate Homo sapiens. <laughs> the, our planet would, would re, rebirth. <laughs> well, there's two minutes left for the last question, so if you would like to ask anything, just raise your hand or wink at me. If you do not, uh, I, if you wouldn't mind me to have also a question that is more personal. <laughs> Following up the discussion, uh, with knowledge comes a great responsibility. Yes. And you know a lot about the potential impacts of things. So did it lead you to any change of your behavior as a customer, for example? Yes, for example, even if I love meat, I reduce the con consumption of meat uh, in, my, in my family. We are, mm, we are trying to use more biological food. Biofood uh, is not better for our health. The, 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 the main effect of biological food is, uh, is, is on the environment. Uh, so we, we, we try to use that. We, uh, we can afford to pay a little bit more for food. So we, we try to buy food which is not heavy on the, on the environment. But in, in a period of crisis, can we pretend that people with very, very, very low income pay twice as much? The main question for the beer question, for example, in the United States, they say, how much I, would you accept to pay more for a beer, for a six pack of beer? Uh, in, and, and, st and still buy it, if you know that it's more acceptable from an environmental point of view. 
and they say something like one dollar and a half. Uh, so in principle, people would accept to pay more to have a better quality of our, of our planet. And information is very important. School is fundamental. Uh, teaching these kind of things at the, from, at the school level is, uh, is important. Well, this is a great challenge for our educational system. Yeah, I mean, everybody is involved in, the, in, the, in this process. Education is, is fundamental from a lot of points of view. And, and food, food knowledge is, is, is important as well. Environmental aspects should be taught to kids. They do it because they, they try to push to different cans for garbage. So there is an education in these terms. But it's very important. If we, if we want to have a future for this planet, uh, that's fundamental. OK. And talking about food and drinks, <laughs> there is a little break. So once again, a round of applause for Franco Zanini, our first speaker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and during the break, you can have another glass of tea or coffee or a glass of water and enjoy some little snack. And we will see each other in 15 minutes. It will. The next part will start at 10.45, so see you around.
this program. And we will start with a guest that came from the nearest neighborhood, from the building that is just 100 meters far from JIC, South Moravian Innovation Center. It is an agency that is established by local universities and city and regional government. Its team helps to create one of the most innovative business ecosystems in Central Europe. Every year they support more than 100 business owners, no matter if they are uh, with some fresh ideas, with startups or with well-established companies. Recently, JIC has been also focusing on sustainability in business. And to be sustainable means also to be circular. And this is one of the topics of the talk that will be presented by Miroslav Londin, that is startup consultant and consultant for business and sustainability at JIC. So Miroslav, it's yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my talk will zoom out a little bit from the great tool of LCA and uh, I, will, I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, the key elements of circular economy that we will need to implement for uh, the green transition, which in my opinion is the biggest challenge that the mankind has ever had to dealt, deal with. I wanted to start with a short question for you, uh, just uh, these two terms, sustainability and science, uh, are very broad. So I'd like to know your association with them. Like, what comes to your mind when you hear them? Guys. So in sustainability, if, if we, had some, we have some finite resource, such sustainable means that we do not take out more than we put back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, it was like for m more for warming, warming up than for uh, the microphone, but for okay, me, sure. Sustainability means that if we have some financial resource, for something to be sustainable means that we do not take out more than we put back in. Mm -hmm. And in science? In is science. It some, it's, is it somehow different? We, we do science to make things sustainable. Uh -huh. But <laughs> I'm okay. not sure whether there's some sustainability in the science itself. <laughs> I don't know. There's not much finite resources there. Cool. We'd like to think that the headroom is nowhere. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Go to infinity and beyond. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? What about you? Okay, I have the same answer. Like, uh, for me, sustainability means like uh, I can do it forever. Because it can, like, if the process is done, it can be done forever and it stays forever. Because, like, let's say there is no limit of resources or anything. Mm -hmm. And what is the role of science in this? Science, I think my colleagues say yeah. right. Like, uh, science is just uh, to sh to find us the road. Yeah, how to find the sustainability. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's have a closer look at the problem but I'd like to uh, have a different mindset. It's not a problem, it's a challenge. And uh, it's a very beautiful challenge that we will need all our skills for. So, currently we uh, operate on the whole world. Our uh, economy operates in a linear, linear style. We take materials and energy from the planet we make products and services from them. And then we somehow transfer them to, to the consumers, so-called consumers, because they consume them. Uh, they use the products, they uh, use the services. And at the end, there is waste and emissions. Of course, uh, the waste and emissions also gets created throughout the process. Uh, but it's still a linear approach. It has two major issues. One, the planet is a finite, finite sphere or spheroid, and uh, the resources are not uh, there forever. It's just uh, they are already running out. The second problem is that at the end of this, a lot of waste, huge amounts of waste is generated, and uh, a lot of uh, unutilized materials uh, are somewhere uh, without any, any use. This uh, is a, a very nice uh, 
report, uh, Circularity Gap Report. It's made by a Dutch uh, company, Circle Economy, every year. This is the last one, and it shows uh, how all the materials flow uh, in the global economy. On the left side, you can see that uh, every year we extract about 100 billion tons of materials from the planet Earth. Actually, uh, it grows, the number grows every year. And uh, uh, these materials, maybe one, one side note, uh, a billion is kind of, a, it's a huge number that's uh, hard to imagine for us as people. Uh, somewhere I heard about a, uh, about a study that said most of the people don't see the difference between 50 million, 500 million, uh, billion and stuff, stuff like that. What helps me is to compare it uh, with, uh, with time. Do you know uh, how much time is uh, a million seconds in days? Four weeks. Four weeks. A little bit less. It's about 12 days. I think it's uh, like uh, 11.6, something like that. And do you know how much uh, a billion seconds is? <laughs> it's uh, close to 32 years. It's a, it's a huge difference. So it's just uh, that the, the size of the material that we, uh, that we take from the planet is so huge that I can't even imagine it. Um, most of it is uh, somehow used, and uh, at the end, uh, there is about a third that uh, becomes waste. It's uh, not used anymore, and only about 9% uh, uh, gets back to the, to the circle, gets uh, used again, recycled, or used in some other, other ways. Uh, when we talk about climate change and the climate crisis, it's uh, not about the future, it's already happening. It's uh, already happening, and uh, if you uh, have a look at the economy, uh, it gets affected by it quite a lot. Uh, the number of uh, natural disasters grows every year, and uh, the costs that are connected to them are uh, growing as well. Only in the year 2020, the estimated cost of the, uh, of the damage caused by natural disasters is 268 billion US dollars. And uh, this is uh, also a comparison of uh, the action and inaction. Uh, action means that we do some proactive poli policies. We uh, do investments and uh, we maybe put in some regulations. It will cost us, but not uh, nearly as much as when we do nothing at the moment. Uh, we just uh, pay for the mitigation of the, of the damages for, for rebuilding what's getting uh, damaged. There's a lot of us. Uh, at the moment, I think it's about 8 billion people on the planet, and it's estimated that by 2050, there will be 10 billion of us. And of course, uh, this uh, brings even more uh, pressure on the resources and on the efficiency. Uh, in 2008, I think, uh, it was calculated that uh, we use uh, resources uh, that we would need one and a half planets for. And uh, at the current uh, way of things, uh, by 2050, we would need almost three planets, but we still only have one, so we somehow need to go uh, in this direction and find out how to do it, uh, how to be uh, still operational as a society uh, with only the one planet that we have. So those are just some numbers and overview of the problem. Let's uh, talk about the nicer part, the solution. Uh, have you heard about donut economics? Just wave at me, who has? Okay. Uh, it's the 
society perspective. Uh, it's um, created by uh, Kate Rayworth. It's, uh, she's a well-renowned economist, I think from Britain, doesn't matter. And uh, she uh, was trying to come up with a new model for our economies that are based on GDP uh, growth. The, the GDP growth is just not uh, sustainable. We cannot have an infinite growth on finite resources. So she uh, came up with this model, which shows uh, like three areas. The first one, the shortfall, is the base of our society that we need to have uh, built somehow. Uh, for each country, it's different. And it's just that for uh, the society, for people to thrive, we need to have uh, proper education, we need to have access to clean water and stuff like that. When we have that, we have this sweet spot, the green donut. It has nothing to do with uh, don free donuts before elections. It's, it's a model. And uh, within, inside it, we can, we can thrive, we can, uh, cooperate and have uh, nice, uh, nice living, hopefully. But we, still, we need to uh, take sure that we don't overcome the planetary boundaries. So this is the current state of global economy. So we already do overcome them in about four areas. And uh, we are on the pathway that, we should, that more of them will, will be just overshot. So, when we look at the economy, uh, the solution uh, is from transferring from linear to circular. circular. This is a model where we use the resources that we took from the Earth and that we uh, built our uh, products and services on as long as possible with uh, as much efficiency as possible. And a very important part is uh, eco-design, where we uh, think about what will happen before the product gets made and what will happen after it, about the life cycle. And uh, also there are smaller circles within the big circle. It's just not, not just one. It's not about recycling. It's about uh, the effectivity of use and the returning every part of this process uh, to the point where we can uh, reiterate it. And on the beginning, there is a very minimal uh, amount of natural resources, which could then last for millennia. And at the end, we shouldn't have ideally any waste. All of the waste gets used for new products and uh, new, uh, new usage. Yeah. So if we want to go on this pathway to become circular, we have about seven key principles or elements that we should implement. They are uh, quite basic, and the core is about uh, the renewable energy and uh, regenerative resources of materials. Uh, it's about uh, prolonging the lifetime, lifetime of the products that we have already created, or products, technology, any material things, and uh, the, to use the waste as a resource. The other five, uh, we'll, I'll get to them uh, later in examples. So the first one, what I did is I, uh, have, I looked at some companies that I think they have already implemented some of the principles, and I'd like to uh, show you on them what the principle is. But uh, most of the companies have uh, could be could be shown in many of the of the elements. It's just for simplification that you can you can have a look at it. So first of all, uh, when you talk about regenerative resources, uh, usually what comes to mind is uh, renewable energy, uh, solar, wind, or uh, or, or uh, geothermal, and uh, as Professor Zanini said, it's not black and white. Definitely, we need to have a look at the whole picture and have the data to uh, evaluate if it makes sense. 
But uh, what helps, for example, is that uh, uh, currently many of the energy providers use EPC, energy performance contracting, where you can actually buy a solar farm or solar roof for your, for your uh, organization, for your building uh, at zero costs. Because the investment is made by the providing company and uh, the money is then uh, paid or the, the investment is then paid from the guaranteed, um, guaranteed savings that it brings you. This is a Czech company that uses uh, very, uh, how to say it, very uh, impractical waste, which is uh, the oil from, from frying pans and frying, uh, frying appliances. And they make uh, cosmetic products from it. They make very unique uh, biopolymer, which is uh, fully biodegradable. And uh, it uh, has no toxicity. It helps, uh, for example, they use it for the sunscreen. And it helps also with uh, coral reef uh, depletion because the common uh, sunscreen, they uh, kill them. They c kill the color corals. This does not. Uh, also, uh, mycelium is a big part of uh, the innovation ecosystem at the moment because many uh, companies come with new products with uh, the packaging or even with houses, uh, some insulation panels made solely from uh, the mycelium of, of some fungi uh, grow, grown on, uh, on, uh, on waste, on wooden waste. So that was the first one. Stretching the life, what, lifetime of the things that we have already built or created. This is a French uh, group of uh, brands of, of ho house appliances, like uh, Tefl, Moulinex, uh, Roventa, I, I'm sure you know them. And they have invested quite a lot of money into uh, repairability, into guarantee that your appliance is uh, at least 10, maybe even 12, 20 years uh, for some appliances repairable. Uh, usually when you have, for example, the uh, blender, at the moment, uh, if it breaks, you just throw it away. It's, uh, it's not worth repairing because a new one uh, costs less and it's not even made for it because it's uh, uh, glued together and you cannot take it apart. So uh, what they did is they tried to offer repairability as a very nice add-on. And also you can, uh, for example, buy the plastic parts as a uh, file uh, for 3D printing. And you don't need to buy it uh, from Spain and have it sent over to Europe. You can just uh, print it yourself at the nearest 3D printer. Fairphone, maybe you noti notice it's uh, one of the one of the f first that uh, wanted to change the uh, smartphone uh, economy because they created a modular smartphone that can be repaired very easily with your by yourself uh, when you just uh, look at their manuals and you can, uh, for example, if your microphone breaks, you just order a microphone and you don't need to buy a new phone. And they do many other uh, amazing stuff. And uh, this repair shop, Czech company, that's uh, based on connecting uh, repairmen with uh, the consumers. And uh, they are trying to uh, fight the, what's it called? In Czech, it's called uh, kazitka, you know, the, the things that uh, are put there uh, to make the appliance obsolete right after the guarantee period uh, ends. So uh, that's what they do. How many elements do you think are in a regular smartphone? Do you have an idea? 500? <laughs> I'm not sure if there are 500 elements in the world. Elements, elements. <laughs> yeah. I think it's about 40 to 60. 
which is a big challenge for recycling process. Uh, some studies say that in one ton of iPhones, you have more gold than in one ton of uh, golden ore. So it's actually, uh, it, could be, it could be better to, to take gold from old smartphones than from the environment. But the recycling process is very difficult because it's in very small amounts. But uh, you see where I'm going, 300 times more gold than a ton of golden ore. So third principle is uh, use waste as a resource. This is one of the uh, fastest growing Czech companies, uh, which does only one simple thing. It connects companies that have some waste with uh, companies that can utilize it, that can use it. And there is a big gap in this. And uh, most of them don't even know that their waste has some value and they just pay for uh, some uh, ecological, uh, the, what's it called? Like the, they, they pay some other companies to take the waste and get rid of it. But they find out that actually they can make a profit on it. Uh, Biopecarna Zemanka, it's a very small uh, company which creates these circular crackers and uh, cookies. Uh, as uh, Professor Zanini said, there is a lot of, uh, a w lot of waste uh, from making beer, the solid waste at the end of it. Uh, they make crackers from it. It's quite unique because uh, the project that they did, it took two years and uh, it's uh, unique in, in Europe. And uh, uh, it's like in small numbers, but there is a way. You need to make sure that everything is clean and everything is uh, food certified, but they did some, some crackers from it. And this is uh, a cookie made from the pulp that stays after creating the juices, uh, the vegetable and fruit juices in Ugo. And another thing, uh, the concrete, we also heard about it uh, today. Uh, concrete is uh, very hard to recycle and uh, it's uh, very unsustainable. The most uh, amount, the biggest amount of waste that we have in Czech Republic is uh, the building construction waste and it usually ends up in landfills. So uh, this company uh, cooperated with uh, Skanska and they created a very unique uh, nanotechnology uh, with which provided uh, solutions for recycling concrete, even with the safety and uh, uh, the standards that, that you need for building uh, big uh, constructions. This is just to show that the value of one material can grow quite rapidly. Uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of plastic waste after this festival. When they collected it and sorted it, it uh, became, first it, it had negative value because you, net, you had to pay for the collectors to, to clean it. And then you had uh, sorted and uh, uh, collected waste. Then you created these pellets and from them uh, they created this uh, sculpture that was sold for like 150,000 Czech crowns. I'm not saying that we should make sculptures from all the plastic waste, definitely not, but it's just uh, to show that sometimes uh, there is a way to creating value from something that's, uh, that has a negative value. How much time do I have? Twenty minutes, right? Twenty minutes, but it's more Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll try to speed up a little bit. Third one, new business models. For many companies and for uh, many products, technologies, uh, new ways of monetizing, uh, monetization uh, are emerging. For example, this uh, Czech company uh, does not only sell printers and scanners, but they provide printing as a service, which has many, many advantages. That the company doesn't need to buy expensive printer, uh, they don't need to take care of it, they, they don't need to service it, which is usually a, 
very complicated or pain in the uh, butt. <laughs> And uh, the same, uh, Philips came out with paper looks where you actually pay for uh, lighting, for light. You don't pay for all the cables, all the lights for your, uh, for your factory, but only pay for the, actually, uh, for the hours that you use them. And uh, Philips or its uh, daughter company at the moment, they take care of everything, so it's quite effective. And, uh, First investment, it's uh, it's much lower. And of, of of course, you can rent many things at the moment, and uh, for many uh, occasions, it's also practical to not own a car, but for example, rent one uh, for each trip, rent a different one, and uh, this uh, car sharing economy is is thriving. Fifth, design for the future. Elishka will talk about it more. Uh, I'll just uh, show some examples. Nilmor is a Czech brand that uh, creates very specific, uh, unique uh, technology for, for recycling the plant-based fabric that they have. Coma Modular, they uh, are from Zlín and they create amazing houses from modules. They uh, they build the modules in the factory, and then they just transfer them to the location and can build a house in like a week or, or a month. And uh, the, it's very effective and it's very flexible. For example, when you are a young couple, you buy one module, then you have a kid, so you buy another module and connect it. Uh, when, then you buy uh, another one for another kid, and when the kid, kid grows up, you can sell the module to someone else and then stay in the one and be very uh, sustainable. And interface is a, is a carpet uh, that's modular as well. Modularity is a big thing. Uh, if you damage one part of the carpet, you don't need to exchange the whole carpet. You just uh, exchange the one, one uh, spot. Digital technology uh, is a big helper. Digitalization is a big helper uh, in the transfer to, to the circular economy. Precision agriculture, chatbots, or uh, some uh, remote gardening, or uh, very smart logistic uh, solutions, all of them help with uh, cutting down costs and with cutting down the environmental footprint. Seventh is cooperation. Uh, team up to create joint value. There are some very nice examples of cooperation among sec sectors that are very different. For example, McDonald's cooperated with Ford and they used the uh, waste that uh, is after brewing coffee. The, how's it called? Yeah, just the coffee grounds, grinds. And uh, they made a useful polymer for the headlights. For the, for the forts, which help with flexibility, durability, and also transparency of the of the plastics. So uh, it uh, you, you need a smaller power of the light to have the uh, bigger amount of uh, of lighting. This is a Brno-based uh, company that cooperates with uh, Mendel University, I think, and they create a uh, unique uh, cricket flower. From the cricket flower, they make crackers, chips, and uh, some uh, supplements. It's quite good. I tasted it. I like it. And it's uh, very resource efficient because you need for like one kilogram of uh, cricket protein, you need, I think, 1,500 times less water than for one kilogram of beef. beef. And uh, also the, the carbon footprint is very low. And this is just a big project that uh, has been there for like decades and is uh, growing and improving every year. It's uh, in Denmark, and it's about, I think, 29, 29 institutes, uh, research organizations, and uh, uh, factories that cooperate together. 
They share water, they utilize each other's waste, and they share uh, energy and uh, heat, and it's an uh, uh, inspiration for the world uh, projects that can be like this. The last one is to strengthen and advance knowledge. I just put some resources for you here. Uh, you can have a look if, you, if you're interested in more examples or into the data that's behind it. And uh, one more note, uh, beware of greenwashing. Uh, I just uh, did a seminar last week about this, so I'll not go, I will not go into detail, but uh, it's a big trend. And uh, many of people want to be sustainable, but if you don't have the data, if you don't have the right uh, grounds for the decisions, it can create even much more negative effect. This is just my contact info if you want to uh, contact me with anything and some uh, bullet points of JIC where you can uh, go if you want to start a business or if you already have a business and have some, uh, have some uh, issues that you'd like help with. That's it for me. Thank you very much for your talk. And we Thank have you. some time for questions. So Yay. once again, I'm asking if there's anyone who would like to ask something, and there is. Lots of these projects were really very small at scale. What are the typical problems to make it the large scale to ma make this meaningful to the like, whole world or country mm -hmm. at least? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems is that uh, the, the effort is quite young and uh, it usually needs a lot of years of, of development. So uh, most of the problems that I talked about or the, the examples they are fresh, so hopefully they will be able to scale, but uh, that's, that's one of the issues. And the other one is that uh, definitely it's much more complicated to create it at a big scalable uh, base than, uh, than uh, on a smaller one, yeah. So hopefully we'll get there, but it's just the beginning. Maybe I would re react on this. Does it maybe is, is it related to the mindset of people as well? Because in, in this sense, we have to create some like you know feeling that we are doing bad and we have to do something something right. Mm -hmm. And th with the richness of people and comfortable life, I think this is, this will be very hard. You know, is there some tutorial how to do? It? <laughs> wow. Okay. That's a uh, yeah, very important but very difficult question. Yes, uh, definitely. The, the biggest uh, obstacle is uh, the mindset of people. Like we have the technology, we already have the money we, can, we need. Uh, the McKinsey company uh, estimated that if we do everything to, uh, for Europe to become circular, it will cost us net zero. It will just, all the investment will be returned and uh, it will even provide a lot of uh, jobs and a lot of uh, new savings. So the money is there, the, uh, the technology is already there, even though it needs some development, but mostly it's about mindset of people and uh, also about demand. Like the demand is growing, uh, for example, for the solutions that I talked about, uh, but it's still uh, minor, uh, like the, the, the majority uh, is looking at the original solutions that are usually cheaper. And uh, so it's a lot about money and it's a lot about mindset. But it's changing. Like more and more people are willing to pay more, willing to pay the green premium for uh, products that are more sustainable. And uh, with the right data and inf information, if we, if we give them to do the right uh, decisions, and not f to fall for some green pushing, greenwashing, I think it might might work. <laughs> Another question. I have more specific about the meaning, uh, because I was shocked when, when we are talking about recycling, especially in the plastics. Um, 
waste uh, because we are at home we try to sort all these plastics to one one pile basically and I was shocked that most of this uh, plastic waste is actually going to be burned not really going back to the circle do you have some knowledge about this or is it is this, this meaning recycling means every time to be used again or used once for the burning and have a heat basically <laughs> uh, it's not black and white. Uh, it, it differs quite a lot. It depends on the type of plastic, on the infrastructure that's in place, like in the location. Uh, but it's true, in Czech Republic, still most of the, it's like about 30% of the plastic that's separated gets recycled, but the rest is used. Uh, if better, it gets used for uh, heat generation in the, in the incineration plants but uh, some of it even ends up in landfills, which is really not good. But uh, as a consumer, I think what we can do is to do the separation and then maybe uh, vote for the politicians that help with the, with the transfer, with the transition. And uh, we need to uh, look for the solutions to better the, uh, the infrastructure. And, uh, of course, for some of the plastics, it actually doesn't make much sense to recycle them because it's more expensive and even more environmentally uh, demanding uh, to, to recycle them than to, for example, burn them. So if you burn them uh, effectively, sometimes it can make sense because you create heat and electricity from it. And uh, the, uh, yeah, so, so it can be, it can be effective in a way. I think uh, it's just, it's a path, you know. It, uh, it cannot be turned on. It's, uh, it's a gradual uh, development. So we need to do what we can do at the moment and hope for the best. Just don't lose hope. Okay, so some other question, uh, other questions, <laughs> but, but at least a yeah. comment. So is, is it really correct to, to call it as a recycling process or no. is there any <laughs> other expression which maybe should be uh, true, no. more, more yeah. true for us as a, as a consumer yeah, to understand? Is, separating is, waste is not recycling. That's very important. Okay, so, it's so another step. It's just we separate it and then we hope, hope it will get recycled. Yeah, but it's not recycling. If you put it into the yellow bin, it's not recycling yet. It is an important step towards it, but it's not, not recycling. Done? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I think we have one minute left for uh, the last question. So, you can take advantage and use the minute, or I will check the offline. Okay, okay. So there, yeah, it is, especially for you. So uh, what's the most interesting uh, project you are currently working on, like with startup? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, the one I personally work with is uh, like actually two companies uh, that, uh, grow, that grow the mycelium and they create products from it, and they have big visions. So for me, I guess it's the, it's the most important, most interesting one, because it's, I'm personally involved. I think there are many uh, great projects out there, but uh, this one is, for me, uh, interesting. Thank you. Okay, and if I may have a question as well. Sure. Uh, we talked about the mindset, and you mentioned a lot of Czech companies with great products that are sustainable. Uh, do you know what motivations are behind these products and behind these companies? Is it the mindset like, I want to do something sustainable, or is it finding a good business opportunity? What do you think, according to your experience? Uh, I think it's uh, more of the first one. The, they want to do something better and uh, they are personally involved at the moment. But it is definitely a business opportunity and we see more and more uh, companies uh, seeing it that way and we'd l like to help them see it that way. It's not just about doing good, but it's, uh, it should be a win-win strategy where you actually grow your business on the right solutions because I think that that's where the biggest lever is. Uh, the, the lever is uh, when it actually 
uh, is better for the environment, for the uh, society, and also makes money. So at the moment, I think it's more about uh, the values for them, but uh, more, more of them, uh, more and more, are becoming also uh, doing it for the pragmatic reasons, where it, it's close to the, then it's close to the greenwashing part where we should take care. But uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's hope for more companies like this. Thank you. So Miroslav Lundin. And if you would like to know more about this topic, sustainability in business, you can also go to jic.cz, where there's a magazine with some more articles, some of them written by Miroslav, and videos and podcasts, and you can learn more. Or you can contact directly Miroslav. Well, and last but not least, there is the last talk of today. Balance is motion. Once you stop moving, you fall. This is the motto of the eco-design studio called Balances Motion. The studio helps companies to innovate their products towards being more sustainable. Main expertise of its team is design, fashion, environmental assessment, material consultancy, product design, 3D visualizations, and rapid prototyping. How they approach innovative materials and uh, how they approach eco-design in general. This is a question for the CEO of the company, of the studio, Eliška Knotkova, that is coming to present to you their, uh, her presentation. Hello. Thank you for having me. Should I, <laughs> should I start it somehow or no? I'm very glad that uh, there have been those two presentations by Mr. Zanine and Mr. Londin because that's like the great starting point for me. Uh, and I would like to add this like design perspective uh, on sustainability. And I would like to actually start with a question uh, because uh, yeah, maybe you are thinking like why talk about design in context of sustainability? Is it even relevant? Well, I believe it is, and I hope it is, uh, and I think it's quite a powerful tool, or it can be a powerful tool, uh, and uh, it's because design can actually um, affect or determine up to 80% of products' environment, environmental footprint, uh, and throughout like a whole life cycle, so that's why we are uh, trying to do it to do the eco-design. This is my uh, small team. We have one more uh, member who wasn't present at the photo shooting, so we are four at the moment. And um, our name, uh, Balances Motion, reflects our like attempt to balance all those aspects of design, because you have to not only focus uh, on sustainability, you have to also be aware of the price point, functionality, aesthetics and you have to somehow find a way how to combine them and make it work for the client. Uh, yeah, so what it is, what's uh, eco-design? Uh, you will find like many different um, answers to this question. Uh, some think it's designed for circular economy, for recycling, for example, or reuse. Uh, it can be about changing the whole um, business model, uh, as you heard before. It could be also about a slight change in materials, which could make like big change in the overall impact. Uh, so you can see that there are like different ways, and which one is the right one or the best one? Uh, yeah, I don't have the answer <laughs> because there is no like the best one or the right one. We don't have the uh, unfortunately we don't have the ultimate. Um, Answer. So we have to really assess each and every uh, project, uh, each and every product on its own and take into consideration, if it's possible, the whole life cycle, whole um, context and also like intentions behind the product because sometimes it really doesn't make sense to make a product like highly durable and long-lasting long if client wants just to use it like single, uh, like uh, it's single use and then it's thrown away, but it's super durable so it doesn't degrade and it couldn't be probably recycled. So it's pretty complex and that's why we uh, like to use like three um, 
areas of expertise or like three pillars we can say and that's uh, product design that's where we all in our team like starting from uh, that's what we uh, studied also and we are combining with uh, material expertise material consultancy and also life cycle assessment which i think is not that common in design uh, especially in czech republic maybe uh, abroad it's more um, normal but uh, we are trying to find a way how to combine those fields and uh, do eco design uh, yeah so i would like to dive a little bit deeper into product design now because you probably can uh, like imagine what it is we are like designing beautiful objects they could like um, uh, function really well uh, they could be really nice but what about the sustainability because uh, it's, uh, it's quite uh, challenging because nobody um, taught us how to do it, how to, how to take it in the game, how to assess it uh, in the design, in the, all those like, decision uh, steps and processes. So we are uh, finding our way and uh, we are using a tool called Let's Wheel. It's been created in 90, so it's... Uh, mm, it's sad to say it's pretty old because uh, <laughs> that's also when I was created. But uh, yeah, uh, it's been some years, but it's, uh, it's still very relevant. And we can use it as a, some starting point when we are thinking, OK, what changes could we um, do? Uh, what steps could we do? What strategies we could choose from? It's good to have like plenty of options. And uh, now you can pick one of them or maybe combine multiple of them if it's possible to uh, innovate in the best possible way. So here you can uh, see uh, some of the strategies. Uh, it could be selection of like better materials. Uh, yeah, we can have discussion uh, afterwards what it means, better materials, but uh, okay, we can focus on materials or we can focus on uh, improving or optimizing uh, material usage, not just change of the material, but how we use it, how we work with it. Uh, we can also uh, optimize the production manufacturing processes uh, that also can be done by design. Uh, not only, but a designer can play a role in it, certainly. And uh, yeah, distribution system, packaging, it also can have a like, significance in the whole decision making process. Uh, the, another, another one, like the reduction of uh, impact during use is uh, often uh, overlooked uh, and I think it's very uh, pity because uh, what the product does or not it's not doing during the phase when it's being used it's very important or, or it can be very important it doesn't have to be that's why we need to assess like each and every one separately uh, but there are also uh, like opportunities for us designers to improve the functionality or maybe prolong or optimize uh, the life uh, lifetime of the product and uh, last but not, not least, uh, the end of life. Uh, we as designers can also impact this. Uh, we don't have like ultimate power um, above, above this, unfortunately, but we can add our, um, yeah, our bits and pieces uh, to make the product more like um, relevant in terms of end of life. And when you look at it, um, you can see that those like strategies are basically following the uh, life cycle of a product. So it's starting with materials, then it's about manufacturing, then it's about uh, use and end of life. And uh, yes, yeah, sometimes it's possible to focus, as I said before, on more levels, on more stages. Sometimes you have to pick one, it depends. But what I would like to draw your attention to now is materials. Uh, and you can obviously see that the first stage and first strategies are about materials. But what's maybe less obvious is that uh, materials can highly impact also uh, yeah, reduction of impact during use because uh, in materials can uh, impact if the material is, uh, for example, emitting some toxic substances during its use, if they are like uh, solid waste created during the use, or if the product is actually durable and will last or not. So again, materials and end of life materials as well. Uh, I'd like you to ask, uh, to guess uh, what kind of product is here uh, being like 
uh, broken down to material composition, <laughs> uh, it's difficult for you because you don't have the scale, but I will it's, tell you it's like this big. Would you guess? Can it be cell phone? Device? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cell phone. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Maybe I gave you a cue with the size, but. <laughs> no, no, no. I was thinking about the transparent materials. There is a lot of. Uh, cooper, uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Copper, copper. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great guess. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's iPhone actually. So a product maybe a lot of you are uh, having in your pocket right now. Very like base, basic product. Product, but uh, as you can see, very complex as well, regarding materials. And uh, many, many, many products nowadays are made like this. Like it's a huge mixture of materials, which are very difficult to be um, uh, sorted out afterwards at the end of life, and that makes things really, really difficult. So, um, and also like to create product, you need to have uh, material knowledge because there are nowadays like over 200,000 materials. So you need to know not maybe all of them, but uh, you should be able to like find the proper one. That's why we are uh, having this like second pillar, uh, material expertise. Me and my colleague Nina, we also work for uh, some years at Materio Prague. Maybe you uh, know this. Uh, it's a um, center for innovative materials and it has branches all over the world. So we have some uh, knowledge in materials and we are using it in the design process. Uh, and we are also um, coming across many questions from our clients and uh, yeah, people uh, who are maybe uh, watching talks uh, like this and they are asking us again, what's the best, most sustainable or most innovative material? Sorry, <laughs> there is none. But I don't want to just disappoint you again and again. So I will give you some maybe hints and tips, what's interesting at least, what could be used in the future and yeah, we can make your, your own uh, your own uh, opinion on it. Uh, recycled plastic, nothing new. Again, like this is from uh, 90s. So this technology for recycling uh, PET bottles into fibers, it's not new. Uh, it has its disadvantages because you can do it like again, 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 because uh, the polymer is slowly degrading. So what's uh, interesting though, is that uh, there is a new technology available for chemical recycling of the PET. And uh, thanks to this technology, we could uh, in the future recycle the polymer uh, multiple times without uh, degrading the quality of the material. So I think it's worth uh, noticing. And, uh, but the fun fact is that <laughs> there is uh, much more uh, PET being used for the fiber uh, manufacturing than uh, that uh, there is like in a bottle. So we could like use all the plastic bottle waste, but we wouldn't have still enough for making all of our clothes. So, so recycling and um, like secondary materials, that's like one option. Uh, second one we have is, uh, or like different perspective, we can look at it as like local materials. That's also like very uh, hyped maybe, uh, maybe sometimes overhyped, but I think it's also worth it like um, being mentioned. And this is example from Italy where uh, they are trying to 3D print houses uh, using like local clay from the property. So you just dig the hole in the, in the ground, you take the uh, clay, you mix it with some very basic and affordable materials, but you have to have the like mixture right, so that's the know-how in this case. And then you uh, 3D print the structure and fill it with uh, rice husks. That's what like on the right picture like the skins from the rice, uh, because Italy is also like a um, very important uh, producer of rice. So they have plenty of this like waste uh, source and it's great insulation material. So you can like, like use these two, these two like local um, basic materials and build a house, which is, I think, exciting. Uh, also, when you know it can cost just under like 1,000 euro, 
and it can be done in less than 100 hours. So it's not probably uh, like most um, long lasting solution for housing, but maybe for the cases where you need to build it really quickly and uh, then maybe just leave it to a <laughs> biodegrade, I don't know. You would probably have to um, put some parts away, but uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, speaking of uh, bio and biodegradation and uh, biomaterials, uh, what I think is very exciting are um, yeah, processes where we involve and engage living organisms. Uh, yeah, mycelium has been uh, already mentioned, but there are like different ones which uh, we can uh, use in this uh, kind of like design process. For example, a yeast. Uh, Yeast uh, can uh, produce collagen, and collagen is what builds uh, leather or like our skin as well. So uh, we can also like grow artificial leather uh, thanks to yeast. Thank you, yeast. Uh, it's really <laughs> great that we don't have to just kill cows or other animals to have like a highly functional and nice leather. Uh, bacteria, uh, on the other hand, they can uh, produce like very nice pigment for uh, fabric dyeing, and um, you just have to like figure out the, uh, the right like mixture, the solution where you like feed and grow the bacteria, and they can produce this uh, these pigments. So you can have very nice uh, colorful garments um, dyed with this technique. And it's also uh, much less intensive uh, for water consumption. So that's a, that's a like, pretty big problem in uh, fabric uh, manufacturing. Like the water consumption is one of the like, huge problems. So maybe in future we will see bacteria could save us in this way. Mycelium, it has been uh, mentioned, but yeah, you can make like many, many different um, things with it. It's, it's great. I love it. <laughs> and uh, also algae. Uh, you can harvest it uh, either from nature or you can grow it on your own. And it's very like modest uh, organism. It uh, consumes like CO2 from the atmosphere. So it does like mm, more than just growing the actual uh, thing, but also like cleaning the air. And uh, you can use the biomass from the algae to um, put it like a filler into a filament for 3D printing. So this uh, base has been 3D printing thanks to algae. And uh, again, like slightly different view <laughs> or perspective on how we can um, use nature in our like design process is called biomimicry. I don't know, have you heard about it? Biomimicry, yeah, perfect. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Uh, it's when we uh, learn from nature, basically, and we uh, investigate the like genius principles which have been invented like thousands and million years ago, and they are tested by time. And we can somehow try to apply them to our human experience and our human design. Uh, this is example uh, from uh, Italy, I think, again. <laughs> and um, yeah, the designers were trying to find like better shape for the plastic bottle, PET bottle, uh, in order to reduce uh, the mass of the material needed. Uh, but uh, they need it for the bottle still to be like pretty solid, pretty hard, uh, resistant. And they uh, noticed that when uh, pine trees are growing in this like twisted shape, they are very resistant to like hostile environments. So they said, okay, we could try to uh, uh, apply this and they did and they really <laughs> succeeded because thanks to this like shape this the shape they were uh, they were and are able to save about like 250 tons uh, of the material per year so that's quite nice and i, I would like to uh, stay in this um, uh, biomimicry uh, topic a little bit for a little bit longer uh, because um, there is like so many ideas and opportunities for us to learn from. And one of them is uh, our bones. Our bones are really <laughs> well designed. They are very hard, they are very resilient, but uh, pretty lightweight. Uh, you wouldn't like to like walk uh, with your bones made of uh, metal probably. Uh, but uh, we as humans can learn from the structure of the bone, which is like full of air. 
and full of holes and like uh, air bubbles. And that's why we can actually um, be so like walking lightly and but still uh, pressure resistant people. And uh, this material, uh, which is made uh, thanks to laser uh, lithography, uh, it's, it's also like applying this principle to material, but on a nanoscale. And I saw that there is like a department of <laughs> nano <laughs> nanomaterial, so not sure if every, anyone from uh, you is <laughs> from this department. You are. You probably know much, much more about nanomaterials than me. So you can maybe add something to this later. But I would like to uh, say that it's very like promising and interesting area for us designers to like maybe um, draw inspiration from or like connect with some of you. Um, nano uh, scientists and try to make something together because this uh, example is about material which is like super resilient super uh, durable but very very lightweight and that could be used in um, automotive airspace yeah and many more applications so that just for your idea what can be done when you are like looking into nature and trying to be inspired uh, another example, uh, maybe more like uh, easily um, applied to practice, is uh, self-cleaning, uh, like property of material. Uh, you can find it, for example, in lotus leaf. That's why it's like symbol of cleanliness and purity. Uh, it's because uh, lotus leaf has like tiny bumps, uh, tiny like uh, structure on its surface and it repels water and dirt, so um, it self-cleans very easily. And again, we can apply it to, um, to, uh, to like certain surfaces, to paint, for example. There is like material called lotus paint, so you can look it up. And it uh, cl cleans itself very uh, quickly and easily. So uh, I think this touches to the part about uh, use phase and how we can like optimize this. Because if you uh, design some product or material which is uh, self-cleaning or I don't know, maybe self-healing, uh, you can um, reduce probably uh, time and money and also resources necessary for doing so, for cleaning it. So that could be a way how to make it more sustainable. Completely different. Uh, uh, example, but still uh, in the area of like nano uh, structure and what it can uh, do actually is uh, from uh, this beautiful butterfly Morpho. Uh, it has uh, again a very interesting structure on its wings and it breaks and reflects light. So uh, you could think like what crazy pigment is in this wing, like none. It's all about the structure. and. We can apply this to materials as well. <laughs> and uh, there is this uh, uh, fiber, which is um, like nanofiber. It's, uh, it consists of, I think, 61 different uh, like nanofibers being joined in one like bigger fiber or yarn. And uh, this combination uh, and its structure, again, creates like very impressive um, colors and effects, but there is like no zero like dying process involved. So I think that's again very interesting. And it could be applied to uh, wood as well, uh, so we not speak just about textiles. Uh, it's a different process, but very similar outcome. Uh, you can use like uh, cellulose, which uh, can have or it has like a crystallic form, and uh, when you apply it um, on the surface of wood, it can create this beautiful like shimmering effect. And it's cellulose, so uh, when you combine it with wood, you end up with like monomaterial solution, which can afterwards be just left in the nature probably or not. But there is no like paint you have to deal with later. Uh, like my... Uh, <laughs> My area of expertise is footwear because I started as a footwear designer. And uh, what's crazy about shoes is that they are like a um, big mixture of materials. They can contain about like 40 different materials and parts, uh, which makes them not just like difficult for dismantling and recycling, but also for manufacturing. And it is pretty expensive and difficult to like compound a shoe. And uh, 
I love this project. It's very inspiring for me because it's uh, redefining the whole like process of uh, making a shoe. And not just shoe, you could apply to different products as well. Uh, Christoph Guberin, uh, he, um, he's uh, like experimenting with self-folding uh, objects and also like materials which adapt uh, to like certain um, conditions, uh, heat or moisture and different ones as well. And uh, we like to call it like 4D materials where the four diamonds is uh, time. And it can, it can be done, for example, that you have like stretchy fabric, you stretch it, then you apply a very thin a layer of um, polymer uh, via 3D printing. That's what you see here, like the shape. And then you cut uh, the outer uh, shape of the shoe and it just folds. <laughs> so you don't have to like glue everything or you don't have to sew it because it just folds and you have the shoe. Obviously you don't have the sole, so <laughs> it's quite necessary part of the shoe and you would have to consider it. But I think as a like, vision for the future, how we could make our product, it's very beautiful. And I mentioned, um, when I was uh, speaking about uh, self-cleaning, I mentioned self-healing. And I think that would be like very, a very powerful uh, thing or aspect to incorp incorporate into a product design. Because imagine that our products could just heal themselves or repair themselves. And uh, maybe it would, uh, or it could help like prolong the lifetime of them. But it's pretty difficult to do so, even though like in nature it's so like obvious and normal when you cut your skin, it heals. So how to do it uh, with our products? There are some, um, some ways. Uh, this is a case study from uh, concrete, from construction. There are some um, research, uh, there is like research being done in this era in Czech Republic. And you can actually, uh, again, use bacteria and uh, incorporate it into the concrete mixture. And when the uh, concrete cracks uh, and like the crack occurs and then some water pours into it, it activates the bacteria and it starts growing, growing, and it basically like fills uh, the crack and it should be uh, still um, usable and uh, resilient. So I think that's very impressive. And now I'm like finished with all these like interesting, promising uh, concepts. And I would like to get a little bit more like realistic and uh, speak a little bit about life cycle assessment and its role in our process. And now I would like to talk about our projects. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have left. Yes, that would be, uh, that could be perfect. Um, yeah, because uh, you have, as you have seen, like so many options, so many like new materials, innovations, possibilities. But at the end of the day, you have to decide like what you're going to do. And for that, like life cycle assessment is a great tool in terms of uh, sustainability. For the other areas, you have to do different uh, things. But for sustainability, I believe it's the best uh, tool. And uh, we use it in two different ways, uh, depending on the project and client. One of them is that we can uh, search for environmental hotspots, like the most, um, like the places in the life cycle of a product where like the biggest impacts are being created, and then we can address that. Uh, it's great for projects or products uh, which are already being uh, produced, so you can collect the data from the manufacturing facilities or from the whole supply chain, and you can assess that. Uh, it could be also uh, done for the product which is just being um, um, designed or not, it's not like being produced yet, then you have to rely on secondary data, which is also possible. It's not as accurate as it's from primary data, but it's doable and better than nothing, I think. And the second option is comparison. If you are uh, uh, standing in front of a decision like, is this material better than this one? I know that I would like to use one of them, but I can decide. Or you have like multiple options regarding the design or the shape itself. Or you have like multiple options regarding uh, end of life scenario. You can also uh, use life cycle assessment for that. 
Uh, first uh, case study is from last year. We worked with uh, M Ocean Agency. It's Czech event agency, and they are very passionate about sustainability, which is great to have uh, clients as, as they are. And uh, they are using a uh, lot of board materials. Um, it's normal in this industry to just like use them for the one time and then throw them uh, away. And uh, that's like horrible because you have like tons of tons of those like pretty uh, nice and solid materials. So why to do this? So they wanted to change that, and they asked us to like um, research if there is a way how to maybe recycle the materials. But um, after some uh, discussions, we decided to first like do uh, more detailed uh, research into the whole life cycle and um, to consider also like other um, other steps or other stages in the life cycle of the board material and uh, try to find if there are also some like um, possibilities or opportunities for um, making it better for innovation. Uh, so basically what we have done is we done a review of like many, many uh, studies uh, using life cycle assessment which have been done in the past in this field because we didn't have data for doing like the life cycle uh, assessment of, on our own at this point and we found out uh, that uh, the energy consumption during production of the board materials is like the biggest hotspot and it needs to be addressed first and the second one actually is using uh, formaldehyde binders which is still uh, very common and uh, so we like also uh, came with some um, suggestions for our client how to address those problems. So when it comes to energy consumption, uh, they should try to find uh, suppliers with like um, better energy mix or preferably like uh, renewable energy sources if that's possible. And for the binders, it's good to uh, find bio-based binders or and AF, it's, uh, it's no edit formaldehyde, formaldehyde sorry, binders, which are available on the market. They are a little bit pricier. So that's the dis disadvantage, uh, but they are like uh, available. And we also, after we did this like uh, life cycle assessment based uh, study, we did also material study and we uh, found like uh, several materials which could be nice uh, alternatives to the ones which are con currently being used. This is one of them. It's called Reboard and it's like sandwich uh, material made of cellulose, recycled cellulose. And it's all uh, again like very lightweight because it's like honey, it has like honeycomb uh, structure inside. So there is plenty of air making it like lightweight. And we also created this um, design, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's like branding for one of their clients, Avon. So they wanted to uh, have a branding sign uh, during uh, one event and we try to help them make it more uh, uh, hopefully sustainable by making it like dismantable and reusable. So it w won't be like used just once, once and that's it. Uh, to the comparison, like the second option we have with um, life cycle assessment. I would like to mention our client Snacks. Maybe you uh, know them because they are pretty successful Czech startup. They are making great uh, period underwear and they were doing it like for some years uh, now, but they were like um, questioning whether it is or isn't really that much sustainable or more sustainable than uh, single use uh, menstrual products. So we, uh, we did life cycle assessment for them to find out uh, and we were uh, comparing or like the functional unit for this study was uh, menstrual protection for one woman uh, per one year. So it means like 2.67 pieces uh, of the underwear versus like 208 pieces of uh, the single used pads and tampons. That's something you have to realize that uh, in life cycle assessment, we are often not like comparing one and one product. We have to uh, set like the what's our uh, functional unit, which was like menstrual uh, protection for one woman. 
and then you have to calculate how many uh, products you need to fulfill that function. It can be uh, this <laughs> different. I won't like dive very deep into this, but uh, you can also find the results on their website. Uh, and uh, but we were like uh, surprised uh, and happy to tell them that uh, their product really is uh, more sustainable than the uh, pads and tampons. And uh, across like different um, impact categories. And this is like our last and most recent project, which is really about design. There is like physical, <laughs> physical um, product coming out of it, which is great because sometimes, sometimes we just do like the consultancy or LCA. So it's very nice for us designers to make uh, something uh, like this. And it's uh, uh, now nominated in the finals in this uh, plastic prize. Um, created by Rosana or Orlandi, so wish us luck. And uh, what is uh, this project about, actually? So you see this weird block. Um, it's a block made of uh, recycled foam from a Czech, uh, Czech company, Yate. And they are uh, producing like many different materials out of foams, and they have a lot of waste. And they are uh, making this, uh, it's called, sorry, it's called Polymix, uh, this like mix of foams. They are uh, producing it for uh, several years, but they don't have so much use for it. Uh, so we were trying to uh, reimagine this material and find like new uh, opportunity for them to create something um, useful and beautiful out of it. And as you can see, we uh, decided to make it uh, modular. Uh, it's because uh, it's... Um, set of benches for public space. And as you can imagine, people aren't always always very nice to like uh, chairs and sofas in public, pay, uh, public space. They can like um, destroy them pretty quickly. So we decided to make it uh, easily um, repairable and you can replace the uh, damaged parts pretty easily. So here you can see the composition uh, the sides and like the legs of the sofa are made also from uh, recycled plastic from plastic guys. I, I think it's a Brno based uh, startup as well. So it's nice to work with uh, like Czech companies and try to find like use for their uh, materials. Here you can see the visualization of the final uh, product. Uh, and we also try to like make just two basic shapes, two basic like segments, and you can then use it in different uh, products. You can make like different uh, sofas or whatever from it. Here's like uh, it could look, uh, look like in, in the use. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. very much as well and now it's time for questions so it's also again me with microphone and checking the online audience so if you would like to ask something you know the process <laughs> so feel free to do so we heard a lot of examples of really innovative materials and I have a feeling like I touched the future for for a while with the presentation <laughs> So naturally, my question will be about the nanomaterials. Uh, <laughs> I was afraid so. <laughs> it's usually the case that you can only fabricate very small portions of these nanomaterials, which was also visible in the photos that it was only microscopic pieces. Have you seen any like large scale application of such materials? Mm, probably as a tre treatment on uh, fabric. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the whole mm, material consists of like nanomaterial, but yeah, you can also have like whole fabric made of nanofibers probably. But other than that, mm, probably not. I think it's the future. We have to figure this out, how to make yeah. it like yeah. into <laughs> like. <laughs> okay, some other question. Miroslav Lundin has a question. So what's your favorite 
<laughs> uh, material, do, material do you mean? or project? Ah, okay. Or both? I think I'm actually like still waiting for like the ideal project to work on because um, usually it's that our client needs cer certain thing to, to be done and uh, we usually can't like really combine all of our knowledge, all of these three, three pillars together. We would like to and we think it would make like the most sense. But sometimes it's time or money or something uh, standing in the way of it. Uh, maybe it's sign I should stop. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we are still waiting for like dream project. Because for example, uh, this last one, FOMI, we didn't have chance uh, yet to do the life cycle assessment. So we would like to do it to be able to like have some uh, quantification of whether it is sustainable or rather like how much it is in comparison maybe with like different material options. So uh, we are uh, trying to do that, and if it uh, if it's possible, that would be great. So I hope I answered. <laughs> yes. Another question. So the microphone is on its way. Okay, thank you. So thank you for a very nice presentation. I wanted to ask you if you directly uh, like cooperating with some scientists on scientific institutions. Uh, not at the moment. But we would like to, if you know about <laughs> scientists who would be like interested in cooperating, yeah, we, we would like to definitely. We so did maybe a little bit some scientists with, uh, who are working with the nanomaterials. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk later. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking for another question. <laughs> and I would like to ask a question. Uh, there was a project uh, I think it was a client's project when you advised to have uh, some renewable energy uh, sources because the energy consumption of it was too large. I don't remember the project, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. but, but I was thinking about the solution, if going towards renewable resources is a good solution, if it's not a tricky one, if there was a possibility to lower the energy consumption yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be even better, of course, but that's something um, difficult to do as a designer or as the like our client even, uh, because that's something which is in the hands of the manufacturer. And sometimes, like the how to explain it, we have a client who is like producing certain type of product, but they don't always own the manufacturing facility. Uh, so, like <laughs> impact that like uh, the amount of energy needed for something to be made, uh, it's sometimes beyond our um, power. Uh, but that would be a great uh, solution, yeah. So for our client, it was easier to look for uh, somebody who is already using uh, solar power or like wind power and different um, sources of like renewable energy. But yeah, this makes sense even more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning it. And we have a space for the last question. So, is there any? If not, I have the last question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you mentioned a lot of materials that were very exciting. Uh, do you think that uh, they are scalable? Is it possible to produce them on a very large scale if there are more clients yeah. that would like to be more sustainable? I think it is possible for some, at least some of them. Uh, yeah, maybe not uh, the nanomaterials at the moment. I believe it will be in the future. But uh, for example, for uh, bio-based materials as mycelium or uh, you saw this leather made of um, yeast, it, it basically is possible, but uh, it would be probably more expensive to buy this type of material. So what I know there is um, like uh, mycelium based uh, leather alternative currently being like more produced more on a like bigger scale and it's thanks to like cooperation of several fashion brands which like funded th this like um, 
um, manufacturing of it and they had to like really say okay we are going to support you and then we are going to like use this material in our production and it enables like um, doing it so yeah I think cooperation as uh, Mr. Londin said is uh, is the key to success even to like um, making it into bigger scale okay so thank you very much it was Eliška Knotková and Eco Design thank Studio you. Balances Motion <laughs> last speech of today okay so ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for coming and for watching us uh, and the biggest thanks goes to our speakers Miroslav Londin of JIC and Eliška Knotková of of Balances Motion and also Mr. Zanini that is not with us anymore but but great thanks goes to him as well I hope that you have enjoyed the presentations. If you missed some information or you would like to go back, you will have a chance because the whole evening, well, not evening, the whole morning was recorded and it will be available uh, on the YouTube of CETEC, BUT or the Rike project. So you can go back and watch it again. And once you are at the YouTube channel, you can go through the last editions of Recape Project Seminars and you can learn more about different topics. To be more specific, uh, you can find seminars about smart cities, smart districts, smart region, women in technology, ethics in science and how to be open in science. So I would like to encourage you to go through the videos and watch it. Well, so thank you very much for your attention to a very important topic and for all the information, for all the discussion, or your insights and thoughts. And now just let's go and apply it. So have a nice day and see you at another Rike Project Seminar. Thanks.